we get started today, I want you to use your imagination with me if you would. Can you do that for me today? Absolutely. I want you to use your imagination. I want you to imagine, if you will, I want you to imagine a large army, a huge army. I mean, as far as you can see, army. Okay? Now, in this army, you have everyone. You have privates all the way up to five-star generals in this huge army. Okay? In this huge army, can I tell you, they looked the part. They looked fierce. They got their we weapons. They look like they are not to be messed with. Okay, y'all y'all get what I'm saying? Y'all got this in your mind? So, all of a sudden, without warning, this fierce, equipped army all of a sudden comes under attack. They get ambushed. They get ambushed. And something happens during the ambush. What happens during the ambush is this. One after the other, after the other. One soldier after the next, after the next, begins to put down his weapon during the ambush. Ambush happening all around him. Soldier puts down his weapon. And another one puts down his weapon. And another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. And it keeps going on and on. Matter of fact, all of these guys, they're putting down their weapons, and they're just going home. It's going home. After the smoke clears and it settles, the remaining soldiers look around, and they realize that 90% of their team, 90% of their support, 90% of their army just went home, laid down their weapons, and just went home, left the battlefield. Now, let me ask you this. Knowing the story of this army, how many of you would say, that's the army I want to protect my country? <laughs> He's laughing. He's like, no, 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 uh, 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 no, no, no. Of course, no one wants this army protecting their country. But can I tell you that as bad as that story seems or those stats seem, can I tell you that those are actual reality numbers? You see, it was recently discovered that as far as Christians go, as far as us in this army, as far as the believer's army, do you know that only one in every 10 believers has ever led somebody to Christ? Do you hear me? One out of every 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One out of every 10. So what does that mean? That means that there's 90% left, nine out of the 10, 90% of us are putting down our weapon and staying in the comfort of a home when it comes to sharing the gospel. The command that Jesus gave to us before he left was for us to do what? Was for us to go and to make disciples. But looking at the numbers, looking at 90%, all that shows us is what? We have laid our weapons down and we have left the battlefield. We've left the battlefield. So what are we going to do to fix that? Well, today marks the beginning of, of what I believe is one of the most important days uh, in, 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 or, or one of the most important seasons, uh, especially in my time as pastor here at the church. But we are collectively going to be spending the next few months with three kingdom goals in mind, three kingdom goals. The first thing that we're going to do over these next few months is to establish a foundation, number one, to make disciples. That's what Jesus told us to do, right? So we're going to spend the next few months making disciples. In other words, fulfilling the Great Commission by growing people in their faith and in their knowledge. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to emphasize uh, increasing evangelism. 
increasing evangelism. In other words, encouraging the spread of the gospel through personal growth and through outreach. The final goal, and again, we're talking kingdom goals here, is for, or is the fact that biblical knowledge would increase. Biblical literacy would increase. Amen? We want to address the growing issue of believers not knowing or not understanding or even reading their Bible. I'm telling you, over the next year, you're going to need your Bible. Amen? So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do that with a combination of, uh, of weekend messages. I'll be speaking on certain topics. And then those topics will be going to small groups and classes all throughout the week. And, and then there'll be some time for you to do some individual studies, some individual devotions. And we're going to be using a phenomenal resource called the Purple Book. The Purple Book. And um, um, it costs $7.00. On Amazon, if you don't, it, does everybody got, has everybody, we've been talking about it for a couple of weeks. Uh, you should have your book by now. Oh, there you go. Look at them in the back. Okay, I see you. Go showing off. Go ahead, y'all. Go ahead. Model men. Okay, I see y'all back there. Okay, okay, okay. Look, yes, yes, yes. Nice. Yes. It was so cool. Today, we started our first group over at church, over at the east side. After our first service, there were 21 people who came and were a part of that group. That is amazing. Seven dollars, though. Y'all, y'all spent more at Dutch Brothers last uh, last time y'all went through. Uh, so, so, so I'm going. I'm going to tell you now because there's always one person. There's always one in the crowd, right? Well, why are you using the Purple Book? Why aren't you using the Bible? If you have opened. The Purple Book, you know, it's all Bible. It's all Bible, front to back. Yeah. And can I tell you, like, like, I, and I'm just, I'm doing this myself. I'm not just up here, like, no, I'm, I'm like going through my, I'm filling out, I'm doing, I'm doing it myself. And I thought to myself, man, I, you know, because I'd like to think I study the Bible a little bit. <laughs> But it's been a while, like, I can't remember how long it's been since I've just been like, just back, forth, back, forth, all new. And I'm telling all my Wednesday night folks, all my basic Bible folks, uh, all that stuff that we learned, the H, the I, all of that's coming into effect. I'm, I'm sitting there the other night, I'm like, okay, oh, Ezekiel, okay, I got, oh, wait, is that mine or is that? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. So all of that's starting to come back into effect. Amen? So, so. As we begin this monumental journey, I want to read something that God himself said about the power of togetherness. Can I do that? Okay. Now, now, God talks about this in relation to actually doing something evil, right? But just imagine how God thinks, how God believes, how God responds when the people are unified and they're doing it for his glory. So God says this. Now, 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 back in Genesis chapter 11, there was a group of folks who got together and said, you know, we're going to be like God. We're going to build ourselves a building. It's going to go to the heavens. We're going to call it the Tower of Babel, and we're just going to keep building and building and building until we get there. And this is what God says. God says in Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, he says, look, the people are united, and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Hmm. Amen? Amen? That's God saying this about something evil. Right. What about you think God is saying about something good? So what are we setting out to do? We are going to be a disciple-making church. Yeah. Amen? So over the next few weeks, there's going to be a lot to cover, uh, and I want to introduce the first topic today. Uh, I'm going to introduce the topic and really the only solution. I'm going to finish this probably on Wednesday night. Uh, like I said, we've got groups now that are going to meet. Uh, we have two Sunday groups, a, a Monday, uh, I'm sorry, Sunday morning group, a Sunday night group with, uh, with the Killams. Uh, we have a Monday morning men's group uh, that will be meeting here. At 8.30, we've got a, um, a Wednesday night group uh, that I'll be leading, a Thursday night group 
uh, that, that uh, is, is being led by Paul. So there's groups all over town, different days for you to get involved. Uh, like I said, I'll be leading the Wednesday night one here. Um, but anyway, to my title or my area of focus today, I want to give us this focus uh, or, 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 or topic as we kind of uh, drill down into the uh, purple book. Uh, I want to simply encourage you with this. Get purple, people. Get purple, people. Can you say that with me? Get purple, people. Yeah, yeah. I know y'all think about that song, Purple People Eater or whatever. Yeah. I am purple leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, we're going to be, and, and you know, when we think about purple and people, I think, man, what, what's the purple about? It's like purple always represents royalty, yes. right? Yes. Represents royalty, represents a uh, 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 Christ in, in his throne. So I want to be a purple person. Um, so, I think I'm accurate when I say this. I know I'm accurate when I look around the room and some of you, I'm just kidding, I'm just playing. <laughs> but the main problem that you and I face, that we all face, that we all struggle with, that we all fight against, that we all battle consistently, is we all deal with the problem of sin. We all deal with the problem. All of us up in here, we are all sinners. We're all sinners. I want you to do me a favor. So, so y'all are quiet this morning. I don't know why. Y'all are acting like y'all are the east side today, okay? I, I, I want you to put one finger up in the air like this. Put one finger up in the air like this. I want you to look at the person either on your left or on your right. I want you to point at them, and I want you to say, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Point out and say, you're a sinner. Now, I want you to remember something. You got one point now, but you got three point right back at you. Okay, okay. So, 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 so don't, 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 don't think you're getting away with it. All right. We are all sinners. What is sin? What is sin? What does it mean to sin? Well, sin comes from the, 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 the translation of the old archery term, which is when you shot an arrow and you missed the target or you missed the mark, that was sin. So sin is missing the mark. Sin is the act of disobeying God. Sin, uh, the Bible says, forgive us our trespasses, right? Sin is trespassing. Thing, right? What is it when you go on a property that you're not supposed to? Or you, it's called what? Trespassing, right? So sin is trespassing, or sin is crossing forbidden boundaries established by God, is what the book tells us, right? So, so when we are trespassing, when we're sin, we are crossing boundaries established by God. In other words, what is sin? Sin is the desire that we all say all. All are born with that involves our selfish desire to choose our satisfaction over God. In other words, to choose our way over his way. We were born that way, y'all. Oh, how dare you? Not me. Not me. You know, lying is a sin, right? You know, pride is a sin, right? Okay, okay, okay. Now, now, now think about it. We were born that way. Okay. <laughs> Let me prove it. How many of y'all are either parents, grandparents, or you have been a child at some point in your life? Anybody? Any, oh, okay, okay, most of you. Okay, okay, okay. I think some of you were either cloned or just dropped in from outer. Okay, okay, either way. So let me ask you something. I'm telling you that we were all born this way. So let me ask you this. Who is it or why is it that when a two-year-old is in a room, 
How old's the little man back there? He's five. Okay, okay. I may be talking about him. But I'm talking about all of us. Okay? But I'm going to use a two-year-old. Hey. Two-year-old in the room. Okay? Only one in the room. You walk in the room. They got chocolate all over their face. All smeared over their clothes. All the cookies that you told them not to eat are gone. Now, you ask them, who ate it? <laughs> now, the answer is one of two people. One of two people. And can I tell you that these two people have been blamed for more things in the history of the world than anyone else. You ask that two-year-old, who ate these cookies? It was either, I don't know, or not me. <laughs> One of those two, I don't know, or not me. I don't know, and not me, and been blamed for all kind of stuff. <laughs> right? But my point is simply this. You did not have to teach the two-year-old how to lie. Right? You didn't have a lying class. Okay, listen, listen, listen. When, when, when you still, the cook, just, just, just don't, don't. You don't have to do that. It's just in them. I know you don't. You, you got too good of a smile, bro. You, I know you don't. You're like, I'm just, I'm, I'm just the best. I'm just, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, no. Nah. So here's the, why is it that a two-year-old knows instinctively how to lie? Why is it? Because it's in this DNA. It's in the DNA. It's in the DNA. See, we have to go back and look at where it all started. We have to go back and look at where it all went wrong. See, the only way to repair the distance and the damage that sin creates, the only way to, 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 to bridge that gap is through Jesus. Amen. So we've got to go back to the garden. And I want us to learn some lessons on sin. So uh, we're going to do that, and we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3, and we'll pick a couple of verses there. I may jump around, guys, depending on time. Uh, let's see how much we can get through. So starting out, the serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals that the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, uh, did God really say you must not eat? From the fruit of what? I need everybody to see this and say this with me. Did God really say you must not eat from the fruit from any? any. Thank you, bro. I like you. Oh, oh, like, oh, promise I'm blocking any. Any trees in the garden. Right. That's the question. The very first thing that the devil asked, the very first appearance, he asks a question. Did God really say that you must not eat of any of all of these delicious, scrumptious treats? Point number one, Robin's always ahead of me and she's right. First point is simply this. Sin always lies. Sin will always lie. You know, there's this wise saying that goes, how a person does anything is how they will do everything. Yeah. Right? How a person does anything is how they will do everything. And that proves true because as we are introduced to the devil in the Bible, the very first thing, the very first words out of his mouth is a lie. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Even though he knows the truth. Right. It's a lie designed to cause doubt. He chooses to deceive. He chooses to deceive by throwing a little tiny word in there. Little word. Doesn't seem like much. Three letters. Any. No big deal. That little word, any, that sets up a huge lie. Right. Did God tell you that you could not eat any? Any? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Come 
all, preacher. <laughs> Any is a small word with big consequences just like sin. So watch this. He asked this question, did he really say you must not eat any? And, and watch what Eve says in verses 2 and 3. Of course, we may eat from the fruit. I'm sorry, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. That's what she says, right? The woman replied, the only one that we can't eat is the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. Whew. Now, we're not allowed to eat it. God said, I quote, you must not eat it. You can't even touch it. But if you do, you will die. Now, can I just, first things first, right? I don't know if anybody else has wondered this. I know I have. But have you ever wondered or thought about why in the heck is Eve talking to a snake? Right. Yeah, yeah right. Like, why is she having a, a snake conversation to begin with? Come on. Come on. I, I mean, you would think it would be strange that Eve would be talking to an animal, especially a snake. But as I was thinking about this and as I was praying about this, the Lord revealed something to me. And he simply revealed this. He said, the fact that Eve is talking to an animal, is talking to a snake, it demonstrates, watch this, the true power, dominion, and authority that God gave to humans to what? Be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and rule the earth. See, she could do that because of the authority and the power that God, when he said, <laughs> rule, <laughs> she could do things like that. So that leads us to our second point, which is simply this. Here she is, she's having this conversation with the devil. Can I tell you this morning that we need to speak at the devil, but never with him? We need to speak at the devil, but never with him. We don't need to have, hey, how you doing, buddy? No, no, no. I command you in the name of Jesus that you need to. That's how we need to talk to the devil. But we don't have to have no entertaining conversation with him. Uh, what? I'm really ugly? What? I'm really, you think so? No, no. We don't have that conversation with him. We need to speak at the devil and never with him. So what we learn, though, is through her conversation, through her, 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 her dialogue with the, with the devil, we find out that Eve does not actually say the same thing that God said. God said this. God said, don't eat from two specific things, um, from one specific thing, actually. He says, don't eat from the tree of good and evil. Right. Yeah. Eve, in her snake conversation, adds a little bit more. Right. First, she doesn't even mention the tree of good and evil. She says, just the tree in the middle of the garden. She just, yeah. she doesn't know specifics. Next, she adds a word. She says, she says, we can't eat it, which is true. Then she says, we can't touch it. Did y'all read anywhere where God said don't touch it? No, he said don't eat it. So the point is simply this, is there's always trouble when we try to add to God's word something that he didn't put in there. So, now fellas, it's our... Man Camp Sunday, we flying high, we celebrating, we good. And uh, <laughs> as much as we would like to put the blame on Eve, the truth is this whole mess that we're in right now, us being sick, us being 
torment, all of that stuff, the whole thing, all the mess that we're dealing with right now, it's all Adam's fault. It's all Adam's fault. You say, well, why is it? Eve is the one who, Eve is the one, who, yeah, yeah, Eve is the one who talked to the snake. Eve is the one who got, yeah, Eve is the one who did all of that. But you know why it's Adam's fault? Because when God said, do not eat from the tree of what? Good and evil. Guess what? Eve wasn't even alive. Eve wasn't even alive. If you go back just a chapter, look, when God tells Adam, don't eat, then the next verse is finding a, a helper suitable for him and rib, blah, blah, blah. Now Eve pops up on the scene. So here's Eve. <laughs> so, 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 so basically, God told Adam this, and Adam didn't com clearly communicate the word of God to his family. Wow. This is a call to us men. We can't be like Adam. We can't be guilty of not relaying the word of God to our family with truth and accuracy. Amen. Yes, Lord. It starts with us, guys. Amen? Where are my model men at? Yes. So, next verse, verses three, I'm sorry, verses four and five. So the devil, the serpent, you won't die. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's silly, God. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. Truth. And you will be like, say like. Like, like God. Knowing both good and evil lie. Okay, point number three. I'm going to have to explain this one. But simply this. Sin will make you think like God is God. Okay? Sin will make you think like God is God. Okay? Um, <laughs> you go to a restaurant and get scrambled eggs. Powdered eggs are like eggs, <laughs> but they're not eggs. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So being like God isn't being God. Right. So, see, and what happens is, watch this. We've all heard that, 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 that the greatest thief of contentment is comparison. Uh -huh. yeah. Right? No matter how content, no matter what you got going on, as soon as you begin to compare, then you become discontent. Right? right? I compare this, I compare. Now I was fine, but all of a sudden, oh, they got now. I got to keep. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. See, what happens is this, is we focus on what we don't have or can't do instead of focusing on what we do have or can do. Right? Yeah. We become discontent. Y'all yeah. don't believe me? Y'all got quiet on me. <laughs> you don't believe me? Okay, I'm going to prove it to you. Y'all want to be all quiet? Okay, cool. Okay. All right, I got something for you. Got something for you. Silent. Okay? Listen to me. Everyone in this room, everyone, I am giving you total autonomy, total authority, total ability. You can look at everything in this room. Look at the cool lights. You can look at all the, you can look at every single thing in this room. The only thing you cannot do is do not look at that box on the wall with the light in it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> you see, as soon as I said don't, the first urge is, mm, mm, mm. right? Oh, yeah. Who felt that? Yeah. 
Uh-huh, uh-huh. The reason you felt that is because you still got that nature in you. You still got that nature in you. You see, <laughs> you still got that nature. Uh, 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 uh. And, and that's what we see here is Eve, you can have all of this. You have the ability to look at all of this. Just don't. But what does Eve do? Oh, Eve believes somehow that she can be like God. She can be like God. Because, you know, God just doesn't want you to, to, to be like him because he knows that you'll have power like him and he'll have, and, and he just doesn't, he wants to keep it all for himself. Huh. Lies. 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 Um, and so in doing that, the devil wants us to, to forget the consequences, which is death. Death is the consequence of sin. So I'm just going to say this because I know this is true um, in so many places. I'm just going to put this out there. When it comes to worship at any church, any religion, any teaching, any denomination, any new age mindset that points or the goal is the ability for you to eventually become your own God. You need to run. You need to run. When the goal is all oh, we reach, we reach nirvana or enlightenment or you become your own. If that's the goal, get out now. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right. So, okay, I need to speed up. I need to speed up. Uh, verse six and seven. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was told by God, who knew better, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, truth, their eyes were opened, but they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Up to this point in time, they were naked and did not even know it. But now all of a sudden they feel shame, which leads me to the next point. Where there is sin, can I tell you that shame isn't that far behind? No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Where there's sin, shame is not that far behind. So here they are. They, they, they kind of make this decision. Oh, God, you know what? Um, we don't really need you, God. We got it from here on out. We can handle the rest of this on our own. Thanks for getting us set up. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go over here and have us a little buffet, and uh, we'll catch you later. Now, here's what happens. The word is they eat the tree, eat from the tree, and they will die, right? But what happened? They uh, took a bite. Heart's still beating. Heart's still beating. See, they didn't physically die, but they died spiritually. They died morally. There was something in them that died that day. Their connection to God died. What was innocent is now replaced by guilt. What is friendship is now replaced by fear. I want to throw something interesting out to you. In, uh, I think it's Psalms, I gotta figure it out, I think it's 140. I think, I'll have to go back and find it though. And in Matthew 17, it says this, I thought this was so interesting, that light can be a garment for the righteous. Amen. Did you know that? Yes. Light can be a garment for the righteous. When you see the description of Christ in Revelation, what is described is what? Light, yeah. right? Moses' face shot. So, so, so all of these descriptions that light can be what? A garment. a garment for the righteous. So I would submit this to you along with some other scholars. See, Adam and Eve, pre-sin, they were righteous. They had never sinned. They were righteous. They were clothed in light. They were clothed in the glory of God. They were clothed. 
And all of a sudden, they took that bite, and the light went out. And all of a sudden, <gasps> the light went out. So what do they do? <laughs> I don't love this part, right? The light goes out. They're hiding. They're ashamed. And you know what? God is doing what? Still looking for them. He knows they sin now, but he's still looking for them. That's God. He knows they've fallen out, but he's still looking for them. So what happens? The Bible says in Genesis, a few verses down, the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and Eve. Their, their fig leaves that they tried didn't cover. It didn't do the job. So God made clothing from animal skins. The last point of the day is simply this. Only his sacrifice can cover our sin. Yeah. Only his sacrifice covers our shame. Only the shed blood covers our shame. No matter what we do, we can sow fig leaves. We can, all of that is not going to get the light back. That's not going to pay the cost. Only his shed blood. I want to give you four scriptures because I believe that there's somebody in here today that when it comes to um, being saved, being born again, when it comes to understanding your relationship and your position with Christ, for some reason you have a belief and you think it is performance based. You think that if I do well, I am going to be blessed. And if I don't do well, I am going to hell. You think you earn somehow God doing in your life. You, you think it's based on works. You, and so you get locked in. So when you, when you don't do well, you really fall off. And you don't realize that when you do do well, your best day is still filthy and terrible. Your best day, right, right. right? You can lock yourself up in the house, close your eyes, put the music on, and you're still not good enough to maintain. So I'm going to give you four scriptures that I want you to build your life on. I want you to build your faith on. I want you to mature your relationship with God on these four scriptures. In terms of being saved, it's not a roller coaster. It's not up and down. It's not like, okay, I was good last week, but ooh, I had a bad weekend and now I'm out. Let me just kind of give you some, again, I'm giving you word now. Amen? Amen. I'm giving you word to build your life on. Number one, Romans 10 and 9 says this. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I need one amen. Can I get one? Okay, okay. All right. For it is believing, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and by opening, uh, by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. So right there is a promise. Not connected to, ooh, man, I got a tied one on this past week and, uh-uh. You do what? Declare that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That one plus one equals you are saved. Amen. 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 Number two, God saved you by his grace. This is Ephesians 2 verses 8 through 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed. So you're saved by grace through faith. God saved you when you believe. So watch this. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. Salvation is not a reward. So, oh, let me earn your salvation today, Lord. Let me earn it. Let me earn it. Oh, 
It's not a reward. It's a gift because of the love that God has for you, the love that Christ had for you. It is a gift to you. Yes, Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says this, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. We are saved. <laughs> We are saved by faith in Christ. And lastly, Romans 5, 8, 9 says this, that God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 I want to take a moment because I believe there's somebody in this room today. I believe that when we talk about salvation, you have an understanding of what it is. You know all the terminology, you know what you're supposed to say, you know, you know all of this, but, but in actuality, you have never, you, 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 you may even believe Jesus as Savior, but you haven't submitted your life to him as Lord. It's like, get me out of hell part. Yeah, I want that. But and the Lord part, mm, keep, no, no, no. Jesus wants to be not only Savior, but Lord of your life. And I, I believe there's somebody here today that, 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 that you know, uh, you have been on this performance-based salvation ever since you've come into the kingdom. It's like, yeah, you, 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 you think, well, because you had a couple of good days, Ooh, me and God are good, and, 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 and then you do something, and it's like, oh, I'm not saved. Now i got to go back and start all over again. Somebody here thinks that. Somebody here believes that whatever they did, whatever mistake, whatever sin, sometimes somebody willfully, some just like, I'm just gonna do it. Some people believe that their sin outreaches the grace of God. They're so bad that God uh he can forgive everything else, but he can't. No, sorry. Sorry. So as a result, you, you, you kind of get on the cycle of, of every week feeling, I, I need to get saved again. I need to get saved again. I need to get saved again. And we just read, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. That leads to salvation. And when you pray a prayer, like we say all the time, this is just the first step in a series of steps of obedience. You don't just, I'm perfect now. No, it's a step by step by step. Obedience. So what I want to do this morning is I want to extend the opportunity this morning. Because I believe there's somebody in here who needs truly salvation. Now watch this. You need salvation for yourself, right? You need to have a belief for yourself, right? I'm looking at my 17-year-old son back there. My 17-year-old son doesn't get credit for riding my coattails. Oh, just because he's a pastor, go ahead and let him all in. No, he has to know Jesus. He has to believe. He has to confess himself. We can't ride grandma's coattails. She prayed for us, yes, but we can't ride her coattails. Mama prayed for us, yes, but we can't ride her coattails. You need to make a decision today for yourself, your salvation, your destiny, your eternity. And God's not going to force you. He's going to give you a choice. And it's for you to choose. To accept or to reject.
say, oh, well, well, I, I gave my life to the Lord, you know, back when I was four years old. Okay? I'm not trying to be funny when I say this, but as with everything in the kingdom of God, your salvation should have some fruit to it. There should be fruit of your, or evidence of your salvation. So just because you said, hey, I did it, and then you walk, and you never went back and revisited it? Mm, I don't want to put that theory to test. I just want to make sure that I'm growing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm struggling, yeah, but I'm still, I'm still moving. I'm st yeah, it's heavier today, but I'm, I'm, but I'm still, but I'm still. Everyone, just for a moment, you would just bow your heads for a second. Um, I just want to give that person or those people the opportunity right now. We've read the scripture. We see what is required for salvation. Stop the merry-go-round. Stop the up and down. Stop the I'm good today. I'm not this. Uh, stop all of that. Believe, confess, receive. Believe, confess, receive. If that's you today and you want to make Jesus not just your savior, not just your ticket out of hell, but you want to make him your Lord. You want to make him the center point of your life. You want to make him the only person on your throne. If that's you, will you just, on the count of three, will you raise your hand? We're going to pray a prayer together. One, two, three. Let me see your hands if that's you this morning. If you want to, God bless you. 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 Thank you for your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Put your hands down. So for those of you that have just raised your hand again, we're going to do exactly what we just read. We're going to pray this prayer based on Romans 10 and 9. Let's pray this prayer together, everyone. Dear Lord, I openly confess that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And according to your word, I am now saved. So thank you, Lord, for saving me by your grace and my faith. Thank you, Lord, that my salvation, my salvation is secured by your blood, by your covenant, by your unending devotion. Thank you, Lord. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit that I can serve you and submit myself to your Lordship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.